Welcome to the war from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, uh, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, today it's time for another episode of The Great Gildersleeve. This one is entitled Marjorie the Actress. The original air date was January 30th of 1944. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you the Kraft Music Hall every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, a little drama staged in almost anyone's kitchen on baking day. Young boy enters, rosy cheek, hungry as a bear cub. Takes one whiff and lets out a whoop. Boy, oh boy, fresh baked bread. Pester's mother until she slices through the crusty brown loaf. Hungry, happy boy shouts. Now for some of that swell parquet margarine. Well, <laughs> you can leave it to Johnny. He knows what it takes to make fresh bread taste extra good. Yes, it's the flavor goodness of parquet that makes bread so downright satisfying to eat. For this quality margarine made by Kraft is truly delicious. Parquet is also one of the best energy foods a growing youngster or hardworking man can eat. And what's more, every pound contains 9,000 units of nutritious vitamin A. All the more reason you should serve parquet as the regular spread for bread in your home. Tomorrow, then, buy parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now for the great Gildersleeve. Like every other town in the country, Summerfield is in the midst of a war bond drive. And wherever big things are doing, there you find Gildersleeve doing things in a big way. He's not only in charge of the door-to-door canvassing being carried on by the air raid wardens in his neighborhood, but he's a member of the committee planning Summerfield's fourth war loan rally. Consequently, he's a very busy man, and he doesn't hesitate to let people know it. Bertie? Yes, sir? How soon? It's almost ready, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'll put it on the table just a minute Miss Marjorie gets here. It's quarter to seven. My meeting's at eight. We won't wait for her, Bertie. Go ahead and serve supper as soon as it's ready. Yes, sir. Confounded. Where is Marjorie, anyway? Down at the Paris house. Leroy, get up off the floor. Okay. You want to read? Read in a decent light. Okay. Where did you say your sister was? Down at the Paris house. They're putting on a show or something. Who is? I don't know. Some gang of nuts. Want to see a picture of a P-61, Unc? Not particularly. What's the show? Hey, uh, a P-61. Mm, so it is. Now, what's I the... I bet you think it's a P-38 just because it's got two tails. So it has. What's the show being put on for? What show? The show Marjorie's in. Oh, I don't even know if she's in it. She just went down to try out. Well, who's doing it? What's it being put on for? No reason. Just a bunch of nuts like Marge. <laughs> Leroy, I think you might be more respectful to your sister. She's found something that interests her. I'm glad to hear it. Probably do her good. Could be. Hey, here she is now. Well, my dear. Hello. Well. <laughs> Aren't you going to take off your coat and stay a while? Oh. Oh, yes. What's eating her? Never mind. We were about to start supper without you, my dear. I have a meeting. War bond committee. Oh, I couldn't eat any supper, thanks. No supper? Are you sick? No, I... Just don't want any. She's in love. Why propose to her? I haven't even seen Wally. I don't care if I never see him. But you have to eat, my dear. You have to eat to live. Not right now, Uncle Mort. I'm too excited, I guess. Well, tell us all about it. How'd it go? I hear you're going to be in a play. Oh, Uncle Mort, he said I had the feeling. He said I had something. Who said this? <laughs> Bruce Fairfield. Well, the Sam Hill is Bruce Fairfield. Oh, you wouldn't know. He's too important. <laughs> Must be too important for me, too. I never heard of him. <laughs> He's our director. He's done a lot of Broadway plays and so on. He's from New York. Hmm. Tell me, my dear, what kind of a show are you putting on? It's not a show. It's a play. Uh, oh, excuse me. A play. Uh, what is it? Well, we haven't decided yet. Well, we've got a name for our organization. We're calling it The Little Theater and the Dell. Yes. Where are you going to get a Dell? <laughs> be quiet, Leroy. <laughs> this was our first real meeting today. Mr. Fairfield had me read a part for him. And, oh, Uncle Morty's wonderful. He said he really thinks I have something. Maybe it's mumps. Leroy. <laughs> and that wasn't all he said. He said I reminded him a little of Catherine Hepburn. That red mop, are you kidding? 
<laughs> it might just possibly interest you to know that Catherine Hepburn has red hair, too. Anyway, he didn't say I looked like Catherine Hepburn. He said I reminded him of her. He ought to know he's worked with all the famous stars. Even Miss Marjorie. Marjorie? Oh, oh, good evening, Betty. Well, what have we got here, Bertie? Some of that meatloaf you like. Oh, brother. Oh, none for me, thank you, Bertie. No meatloaf? No, I, I couldn't just now. Uh, she says she's not hungry, Bertie. Oh, but my land, a child's got to eat. Can't I get you something? Well, you wouldn't have an artichoke, I suppose. Artichoke? Who eats artichokes? You know we ain't got no artichokes. <laughs> I won't have anything then. I never heard of such a thing. Leroy, you ain't going back on the meatloaf, too. Not me. I could eat a horse. Well, we ain't come to that yet. <laughs> artichokes. I'd just soon eat a porcupine. Artichokes is for rich folks. You know who I bet he's artichokes? This Bruce Fairfield. Leroy, you've never even met him. Oh, dearie me, I can't eat a thing this evening. I think I'll just toy with an artichoke. Go on, please, please, please. Listen. No, Marjorie. Leroy, eat your meatloaf. Yes, eat. Go on, stuff yourself. Shovel it in. That's all anybody thinks about in this house, eating. Nobody has any time for the finer things. I'm sure I don't know what's come over that girl. She ain't herself this evening. You bet she ain't. She's Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> How beloved. Oh, my darling. Kiss me, beloved, ere I so wound. Eat your meatloaf, Leroy, ere I so what. <laughs> Good morning, Marjorie. Feeling better this morning? I feel all right, thank you. Woo! Look at the new hairdo. So that's what you've been doing upstairs for the last two hours. It took me about ten minutes, and it's none of your business. Oh, pardon me, Miss Hepburn. Oh, be quiet, little boy. <laughs> uh, Marjorie, I, I want to have a family conference, if you don't mind. Oh, just as soon as I make this call. We'll hurry it up. What's the conference about, Unc? You'll find out in just a minute. Bertie better be in on this, too. Oh, Bertie! Hello, Sally. I won't be able to come to your house this afternoon. I'm sorry. You call me Miss Cutie? Yes, Bertie. Can I please have it quiet for a minute? Oh. I'm sorry, Sally, but I just can't come, that's all. Oh, because I have to be at the theater. Oh, what a boa. <laughs> Leroy, you be quiet. Let's get this phone call over with. Well, it isn't exactly a rehearsal, Sally. We're just going to have a reading. Well, it isn't exactly a reading because we haven't chosen a play yet. I'm sorry, Sally. I said I was sorry, didn't I? Well, I just happen to think your little party isn't as important as my career, that's all. Bye. Uh, career now. Sit down now. I want to get everything planned for our guest. Guest? Guest? Yes. In connection with the Summerfield Bond Drive, our city will be honored by the presence of an outstanding war hero who will speak at the rally tomorrow night. And we are to have the privilege of entertaining him here in our house. MacArthur? Yeah, MacArthur. <laughs> <laughs> no, Leroy. MacArthur's busy killing Japs. The man who's coming here is Colonel White. And he shot down six planes in the last war, and he's a squadron leader in this one. Oh, boy, a flyer. Can he sleep in my room, Unc? Well, I'm glad to see your hospitable attitude, Leroy, but I think we'll put him in a sewing room. Oh, that little old army cop. Well, he'd probably feel uncomfortable sleeping anywhere else, Bertie. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, what about lunch, huh? Can we have something nice for him? Well, I'll do my best, Mr. Gilsey. I don't know much about high-altitude cooking. <laughs> well, you just cook for this man as if he'd never been off the ground, Bertie. He'll love it. Now, Marjorie, I was thinking if you could sort of uh, show the colonel around this afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, Uncle Mort. My rehearsal. Yes, yes, yes. Now, listen, my dear. I think your interest in the drama is a very fine thing. I don't want to discourage it, but there's a war on. We all have to make some sacrifices in wartime, you know. Oh, we do? What sacrifice are you making? Me? Why, uh... You won't even let this hero have your bed because you don't like to sleep in the sewing room. Marjorie, that's not true. He can have my bed if he wants it. Why, George, you'll have it whether he wants it or not. <laughs> Bertie, will you make up my bed for the colonel? Yes, sir. Two clean sheets? For the colonel, yes, two. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you can fix the cot in the sewing room for me... Yes, sir. I'll show you how to make sacrifices in wartime. And you, young lady, you can be here for lunch anyway. And I want you to be just as nice as you know how. How is the colonel coming here, Unc, in a bomber? 
know Leroy in a train. Oh, I thought maybe he could take me up for a little ride. He's coming on the 12.15, so he ought to be here any minute. He might have changed his plan so he had to fly after all. Maybe he came in a P-61 and he could give me a ride in that. Maybe he'd let me shoot the machine guns a few times. Stop talking, Leroy. Nothing is coming out. Oh, well. <laughs> hey, there's the judge's car. Oh? He's got the colonel with him. I'll let him in, Uncle. Huh? I'll let him in. Leroy. Okay. Is the judge going to stay for lunch? No, whether he knows it or not. <laughs> Well, well, Colonel White, I presume. That's me. I was just going to introduce you, Throckmorton. Colonel White, I take pleasure in presenting my good friend, Throckmorton Gildersleeve. Glad to meet you, Mr. Gildersleeve. It's an honor to meet you, Colonel. Welcome to Summerfield and come in. Thank you. Uh, let me have your coat. I'll take it, Unc. Hi, Judge. Hello, Leroy. Oh, Colonel, and this is my nephew, Leroy. Colonel White, Leroy. How are you, son? Fine. Have you fought a P-61 yet? Well, not yet, but I hope to soon. Oh, have you fought a B-26? Yes, I phoned that. Uh, boy's just crazy about airplane colonels. <laughs> <laughs> so I see. Hey, hey, come in the living room, will you, Colonel? I want to show you something. Leroy, stop yanking the colonel around. Oh, well, that's all right, Mr. Gildersleeve. I don't believe he can hurt me. He's a fine man, Throckmorton. Finest type of American soldier. Oh, seems to be, yes. Tell me one thing, old man. Do I smell lamb chops? <laughs> Confounded hooker, you can't stay to lunch. Well, I brought the colonel. I don't care. There are only seven lamb chops. If you stay, the colonel and I can't have seconds. <laughs> All I know is the colonel expects me to stay and talk about the details of his speech. After all, you'll have to give up your second lamb chop, Gildy. <laughs> this is a dirty trick, you old goat. Now, nah, we all have to make sacrifices in wartime, you know. Yeah, but by George, I'm making more than my share. And then he comes tearing down out of the sun and gives him the old... <laughs> Leroy. Your nephew's found out things about air combat that I never knew, Mr. Gilbertsleeve. I guess I ought to see more movies. You want to see Destination Tokyo this afternoon? It's at the beach, you. Now, Leroy, the colonel's going to be busy this afternoon. Well, that reminds me. Go tell Bertie Leroy I've persuaded Judge Hooker to stay to lunch. Gosh! How'd you do that? Leroy. <laughs> Leroy, take the message to Bertie. Okay. And tell her we can have lunch as soon as Marjorie comes out. Okay. Hey, Marge, hurry up! Lunch! <laughs> I want you to meet my niece, Marjorie, Colonel. I think she's a mighty nice girl. You bet your life she is. Pretty, too. Well, here she comes, Colonel. You can see for yourself. Well, she sure is. Good afternoon, Judge. Afternoon, Marjorie. Uh, Colonel White, this she's is... She's my niece, Judge. Marjorie, I take pleasure in presenting Colonel White. How do you do? How do you do, Colonel? Say, uh, am I crazy? No, I'm not. There's something about you that suggests Catherine Hepburn. Oh, do you really think so? <laughs> <laughs> oh, for corn's sake. Come on, Colonel Chow! <laughs> Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Serving families the most nutritious foods without being extravagant is a challenge we all face today. Sometimes, too, there's as much difference as an extra war-saving stamp or two in some of the same kinds of food, as, for instance, spreads for bread. And that's good reason why you should be acquainted now with economical parquet margarine. Sure, you know, parquet, the one that's made by Kraft. The margarine that tastes so good when it's spread on bread, on muffins or pancakes or waffles. Yes, parquet margarine can be a big help in keeping appetites up and your food budget down. At the same time, parquet helps provide important food elements your family needs for good daily nutrition. You see, parquet is actually one of the best energy foods you can serve. And to every pound of this nutritious spread for America's bread, Kraft adds 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So for good nutrition, delicious flavor, and for economy's sake, too, buy and serve parquet. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's return to the great Gildersleeve. Colonel White has been his guest overnight and has made a big hit with everybody, although no one but Leroy has been able to get in a word. After breakfast the following morning, Leroy is still at it. How big a crew does it carry? Has it got a ball turret? What's its ceiling? Did you ever fly on one? Oh, Leroy. One question at a time, young man. Don't you think the colonel ever wants to talk about anything but the war? Why should he? Hey, tell me, colonel. Now, Leroy, that'll be enough. <laughs> oh, oh I, I don't mind. Colonel White has been very patient, Leroy, but you have no business monopolizing him. 
Besides, it's time you were getting along to school. Aw, uh, can I ask him just one more question, Unc? Just one? Well, if the Colonel can stand it. Ever had the third degree before, Colonel? Go ahead, son. What's the question? Do you know any military secrets? <laughs> Why? Have you got a market for them? No kidding, do you? Leroy, Uncle Mort, really? No, my boy. Uh, just one secret, Colonel. Just a little one. Anything at all. Anything the other kids don't know. Well, I don't know anything that would be much use to the enemy, but uh, if you'll come over here, I'll whisper one in your ear. Yeah? What? Radar. Oh, who doesn't know that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Leroy, off to school. Okay. So long, Colonel. See you later. Well, shall we go in the other room? I know you've got things to do today, Colonel. And if you'll excuse me, i got a little uh, furnace work to do down in the cellar before I leave. Uh, ash day. Go right ahead. Yeah, he used to have a man to do this, Colonel, but you know, with a manpower shortage. <laughs> yes, indeed. Good night, uh, Good night. Uh, so long. Uh, goodbye, Leroy. <clears throat> well, I guess I'll run up to my room for a minute. Oh, Colonel White. Yes? I've been wanting to speak to you alone. Well, don't tell me you're after a military secret, too. Must you joke? I beg pardon? You don't need to pretend with me. Am I pretending? I know what you must be thinking. I want to apologize for my brother and my uncle. Apologize? You see, Summerfield is a small town, and we're small town people. I guess there isn't anything we can do about that. But we don't have to be satisfied with it. I think Summerfield is a swell town, from what I've seen of it. Oh, you don't have to be polite with me, Colonel. I understand. I wish I did. <laughs> You're from New York, aren't you? It must be wonderful to live in New York. I suppose you go to a new play every night. Oh, hardly that. Uh, but you do love the theater, don't you? Well, I like a good show, yes. Oh, it's wonderful to meet someone who really understands. <laughs> I knew the first moment I saw you. You're not like my uncle and all these people around here leading their little lives. You've lived. They just exist. <laughs> I don't know that I follow you. Oh, people are so tragic, aren't they? Listen to him down there shaking the furnace. Poor Uncle Mort. What is he to look forward to? Well, I'm not going to get stuck here in Summerfield. I don't know what you have in mind, but I wouldn't rush into anything. You're an attractive girl. You have a nice home here. Where would the world be if we were satisfied with that? Where would... Where would Catherine Hepburn be today if she had stayed in Hartford all her life? Hartford, I suppose. <laughs> exactly. Oh, here comes my uncle. Oh, I don't know how to say it, but you brought me a glimpse of a new world. Well, oh. you two still standing here? Shall we be getting along downtown, Colonel? I'll be right with you. I've just got to run up to my room. Yeah. Well, my dear, what have you two been in such deep conversation about? Something you wouldn't even understand. Oh, uh, pardon me. <laughs> I wonder if you'd be very surprised to know that I've met the man whom I shall one day marry. Marjorie, stop your nonsense. Remind me to order some more coal, will you? Because we only got enough coal to let... What did you say? <laughs> oh, heck, Unc. I'm disappointed in Colonel White. Disappointed, Leroy? Why? I thought he was a man's man, and here he's been off with Marge all afternoon. Yes. I wonder where she could have taken him, confound it. It's your fault. You sicked her onto him. <laughs> you don't suppose she would take him to that place called Barney Brownie's Beanery, do you? Brownie's Beanery. Yeah. yeah, she might. That's all there is in the afternoon. Hmm. You want me to call up? No, 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 no. He'll be here for supper, all right. He knows he's got to speak at the rally in a couple of hours. <laughs> See who that is, would you, Leroy? Sure. Maybe it's Marge and she forgot her keys. <coughs> Mr. Peavy! Hey, Uncle, it's Mr. Peavy. Hello, Leroy. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Peavy. Good evening, Mr. Gildersleeve. I, I just dropped in to make my bond report. Oh, yes, yes. Take off your coat and make yourself at home. Hmm, thank you. It won't take me very long to report. There are only 16 houses in my block. Judge Hooker sold $2,000 worth, and there's only four houses in his block. Never mind, Leroy. Those are pretty big houses. What difference does that make? Young man, I'm not in the mood to discuss economics with you right now. Go somewhere and play with your toys. Toys? He thinks I still have toys. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, I 
I'm afraid I didn't do as well as the judge. No? No. $2,000, my. The trouble with you is you don't push hard enough, Phoebe. You're not aggressive enough. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, it's the truth just the same. You have to make an emotional, dramatic appeal. Uh, me, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, you ought to try. How did you make out? Well, here are the applications and the money. I I sold $600 worth altogether. Well, that's very good, Peavy. Not bad at all. Well, it's not much money in a drive for $14 billion, but I'm kind of proud of one thing. Oh? What's that? I sold a bond in every house on my street. Why, Peavy, that's wonderful. You're the best salesman in Summerfield. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you see, every house on my street has a boy in service, and... They want him to come back home, that's all. Well, you did a fine job anyhow, Peavy. Yeah, I think I'd better be going, Mr. Gillespie. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Peavy, what do you do when a young girl falls in love with an older man? Well, that's a hard question for me to answer. It never happened to me. <laughs> no, I suppose not. At least it hasn't yet. Now, this is serious, Peavy. That is, it could be. Marjorie may be falling for a man 25 years older than herself. What can I do about it? Well, why don't you explain to Marjorie that when she's 35, the man will be 60. And when she's 45, he'll be 70. And when she's 60, he'll be 85. Yeah, and when she's 90, he'll be 115. (laughs) That's right. It gets worse as you get older. Why, that's silly. If a girl wants a man now, what does she care about ten years from now? Eh, I guess I'll... Ha- oh, there they are now. Uh, the Colonel's here, Bertie. Well, I had a wonderful time, Colonel. Uh, so did I. You make me feel younger than I have in here. Oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to do something about this. <laughs> Come in. Uh, is it all right? Sure, come in. I'm just packing my bag. I'll have to leave right after the rally, so I better do it now. Oh, uh, can I help? Uh, no, thanks. It won't take me a minute. We travel light in the Army. Well, we're expecting great things from this rally, Colonel. To tell you the truth, I'd rather face the Japs than an audience. Uh, but I'll be doing the same thing tomorrow in Little Falls. We're going to be sorry to have you leave, Colonel. Well, I'm sorry to have to. You treated me like a million dollars here, all of you. I think you have a very nice family. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to speak to you about Marjorie. Uh, she seems very much interested in the stage. Uh, yeah, so we've had to put up with that. She, uh, seems to have taken quite a fancy to you, too. Well, you know. Uh, I hope she hasn't been making a fool of herself. I know she has. Well, young girl sees a uniform, you know. And then she seems to have me mixed up with New York in her mind. And she seems to have New York mixed up with Mecca. Uh, there we are. That didn't take long, did it? Uh, Colonel, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor before you go. Glad to. What is it? I want you to go down in the living room and have a talk with Marjorie. Well, I told you I'm not much of a speech maker. Oh, you can do it. You're the only one who can. If you don't straighten her out before you leave, I'll have the devil's own time with her after you're gone. I know that girl. Well, I'll be glad to try. Great. Come on. She's down there now waiting to say goodbye. All right. Now, Colonel, all you have to do is give her a little fatherly advice. You know, point out that you're older than she is and so on. Well, this is a little out of my line. I'll just wait outside here. You go ahead. She's in there. I'll be listening. (laughs) (laughs) Well... Colonel, you're going. Yes, my plane leaves right after the rally. How oh, it must be wonderful to fly, to feel the cool, clean, fresh wind in your face, to leave the earth behind with all its stupidity. Oh, I wish I could fly with you. Yes, I wanted to speak to you about that. Oh, don't. Don't speak. Let us just have this moment together, this last small moment. Well, uh, if you don't mind. Please. Now, listen, my dear. Don't call me my dear. You sound like my uncle. Well, I'm old enough to be your uncle. Has that ever occurred to you? Oh, you're going to treat me like a child now. What difference do our ages make? What is time? What is anything? 
You make it a little difficult to argue. What are arguments? Words, words. Let's be honest with each other, shall we? I'm for that. Let's have the courage to be frank. Let's call a spade a spade. All right. You start. (laughs) Well, let's face it. You're a man. I'm a woman. I go along with you so far. (laughs) You once had the kindness to say that you found me attractive. Well, I find you attractive. Uh, Well, that's fine, uh, but Marjorie, you've got to realize... Oh, nothing you can say will change it. That's just the way it is, that's all. That's life, I guess. You go away now and I won't see you. You'll be off to the wall where your duty lies. I won't try to hold you, but promise me one thing. What's that? When it's all over and you come back to the city you've loved so much... If I come to New York, may I look you up? Uh, why, sure. I'd be glad to see you any time. That's all. That's all I ask. But, Marjorie, you, you don't realize if you just listen... Don't you see? Nothing you could ever say or do would change it, because I ask so little. <clears throat> Marjorie. Yes? I have a confession to make. Yes? I'm mad about you. Wild about you. Oh, please. All last night I lay awake dreaming of the moment when I would crush you in my arms. Oh, no, And please. now, come away with me, Marjorie, now, tonight, this minute. I don't let go. You will, you must. I have a wife and seven children, but never mind them. Fly <laughs> with me in my flying machine. No, no, no! <laughs> Thanks, Colonel. <laughs> Six is 16, and eight is 24, and three is 27. Just leave. You got a minute? Six is 33. Just a second, Bertie. Excuse me. Uh, 33 and eight is 41. 44. Gee, is that all? Uh, sorry, Bertie. I'm just adding up the amount of war bonds we've sold in this neighborhood. It's not too good. Well, Mr. Gillsleeve, you can add this. Huh? What? Why, Bertie? Eighteen dollars and seventy-five cents. I never thought I'd make it, but it's all there. Why, that'll buy a twenty-five dollar bond. Oh, that's great, Bertie. Oh, shucks, it ought to be a hundred. I know that. But I think if I can buy one of these every month, of course I know they can't hold up the invasion for me. But give me time, I'll get there. <laughs> well, I only wish more people figured that way, Bertie. I was thinking, Mr. Gillsleeve, you got any of them slips of paper where it says sell me a bond? Uh oh, you mean application forms? Oh, sure. But uh, what's the idea, Bertie? Well, sir, I got a meeting down at the lodge tonight, and there ain't no reason for it except a lot of folks want to sit around and talk. Just a little old unfinished business, that's all. <laughs> and I figured I'd hand around some of them applications. Well, you're welcome to all you want, Bertie, but uh, do you think you can sell any? After all, that's it. A... You just watch me. I'm going to say to them folks, now you listen to me. You folks sitting around here gabbing. We got a war going on. We got a lot of unfinished business, and we ain't doing anything about it to finish it. I'm going to say to them, there's a plenty of you folks making more money than you ever made before in your lives. And what you doing with it? Throwing it around. And in these days, that's a sin. Anybody who spends his money for anything but the food he needs to eat and the clothes he needs on his back, that's a sin. And he's a fool besides. Because things just ain't got the stuff in them these days. You go buy yourself a fancy new patent leather handbag, and what happens? Right away the handle comes off, because they ain't got the stuff. Yes. The stuff is going to the soldiers where it belongs. So get some sense and put your money where it belongs and where it's going to do somebody some good. Put it into war bonds. That's what I'll tell them, and they'll do it. They're good people. They want to fight this war just as hard as anybody else. But they, you know, they get a little careless sometimes, that's all. Yeah, don't we all. Well, here you are, Bertie. Here are the applications. Go get them. I will. Good night, Miss Gilsey. Good night, Bertie. God bless you. Good night, everybody. Music heard on this program.
program was under the direction of Claude Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. Well, this is the second War Bond episode of the uh, Drive episode of the season, but then again, they were having multiple war loan drives that were uh, going on, and each one was important. I think that what I like here is the plot's very much different than what we heard from the September show, and Great Gildersleeve and Fripper McGee and Molly, for that matter, continue to remain, didn't just become shows that were all about the war and propaganda, but they were uh, family sitcoms that included some uh, some mentions and, and encouragement about the war in general. I also really appreciated Lillian Randolph as Birdie getting to make the big war bond appeal, which I think shows the degree that they grew the character of Birdie from the way she was portrayed back in the first season, and the respect that Lillian Randolph had from members of the cast. That will do it for today. If you uh, have a comment, email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. I welcome your story or that of loved ones who served during World War II. Ken Curlin provides our opening theme music, kencurlin.com. I am your host, Adam Graham. This uh, series is provided as a service of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, greatdetectives.net.